introduction um, for uh, Carmen, Marcello, Carmen Marcello, who is the Executive VP Strategy, I'm going to sit down here, at Hydro One, otherwise known in Ontario as WIRES. Um, at one time, a prior government in Ontario thought that uh, WIRES should be all privatized. And that was uh, chugging along and uh, prospectuses were being drafted and the province province the citizens were going to own it, but uh, then that all changed, and now Hydro is sort of half pregnant. It's still fully owned by the government of Ontario, Wires is, and then there's also um, uh, Ontario uh, Energy Generation, which is also uh, fully owned. Um, I have a slight confession to make and slight possible conflict. I do have an indirect role in Ontario's uh, electricity generation policy because I'm on a review board which hands out grants for community development of alternative energy sources. Um, Ontario has uh, advertised itself as being a leader in North America in this area with our feed-in tariff and the Green Energy Act. Um, but my task is very easy, really. The rules say if you come in with a good idea, here's a check. So the government's all for uh, alternative energy. Now, Carmen um, is one of those executives that knows how to do things. He's an engineer. Now, of course, he's got an MBA, as everybody has to, to have one of these senior executive jobs, but he really knows how to make things. And uh, he's worked his way up for uh, well over 20 years in many senior executive positions. Uh, and um, uh, using that engineering uh, background, I'm sure. Um, and he started at um, Hydro when it was quite a different beast way back in 1987. Um, so the, uh, without further ado, I'm going to let him explain the, uh, what uh, Wires does, uh, Hydro One, and how it can, how it is, and how it can perhaps get more involved in cross-border U.S and Canadian electricity transmission. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank Dan for inviting me. Unlike uh, Al, who took three seconds to make up his mind on whether to come or not, um, I think I got the uh, Jim Blanchard treatment from, uh, and he's not here to comment. He gave us some really good excuses about what happened to his arm, but I don't believe it. I'm sure Dan put the arm on him. Um, I, I fought tooth and nail. I didn't want to come, and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Um, as a starting point, I'm an engineer, and I like to get stuff done. And how many engineers in the room? <laughs> All right. So I've heard a lot about policy and 900-page documents and all the rest, and uh, how many lawyers in the room? Okay. So part of the frustration was, how do you get all these policies aligned? And the last question from uh, Governor Blanchard was, should we have a common approach? And uh, Al said no. And I will make a personal comment. Could you put that in there? Personal. Because I do work for Hydro One, an agency of the Crown. Um, we are completely owned by the government of Ontario. Uh, we answer to our bondholders, so we care about uh, what standard and poors have to say, and we do care about operating in a commercial manner. But uh, I, these comments are my own. Yeah, we should have a common approach. And when you think about trade, electricity trade, water, I think that was raised earlier today, and uh, climate change, and then you sit back and you were to take a regional entity, and by regional entity, I'll say the Northeast, and I'm talking in terms of Quebec, the Maritimes, the Northeast US, Ontario, and from a, a technical term, I'll say the ECAR, PJM, so the area we're in right now. And you were to sit back and say, let's run this machine we call the grid in a optimal manner. Now, optimal is very interesting. And if we had a common approach to what optimal meant, I would assume price would it be in there, definitely reliability, because if I wanted to get someone's attention, all I had to do was 
do this in my control room, and the lights would go out. And before you knew it, <laughs> everybody's going, what the hell just happened? So we can turn them back on. Thanks for the drama. Uh, but it, it, you got to remember, keeping the lights on is what folks like me are all about. Everything else is nice and interesting. The second those lights go out, no one cares about anything. But that said, think about a common approach. We've all agreed on the definition of reliability. We've all agreed on what is affordable. We've all agreed on what mechanism we're going to use to talk about um, clean. And then you sit back and you turn it over to a bunch of engineers and you say, run this system. And I would venture that the system would look pretty interesting. You'd have Hydro-Quebec with huge opportunities to store water. And I know we can't store electricity in real time, but we can store water. You've got huge interconnection capabilities between Quebec and the Northeast, Ontario and Quebec and the Northeast, Ontario and Manitoba, Manitoba and uh, the US. I mean, there, this grid is a huge machine with a lot of capability. So there's a lot of, I'll say, green. I'll say there's a lot of clean north of the border. And now run that system in an optimal manner. So think about all the policy things that would have to take place to get to a point where you can just turn it over to a bunch of engineers and say, just, just make it happen. Well, the reality is there isn't a, a, even a consistent definition on reliability. We don't know what's a fair price. We can keep debating it. Uh, I've been in conferences where nuclear is clean and nuclear is the devil. I've been in conferences where there's uh, big hydro in Quebec is the devil, but coal is clean. And, you know, you could understand it from local political reasons, but all of those things need to be uh, brought together. So. Um, again, and that's my personal comment, and I'm saying it again for the record because uh, uh, in a minute I'm going to get into uh, some of the prepared text, and back to my comment, Dan convinced me to come. Um, I came reluctantly because I didn't really know what to say from an Ontario perspective. So now that I've said that, we do have a place in terms of energy trade. Um, I do want to focus on um, what can be done when there is some clarity. So within Ontario, I'm going to talk about Ontario as a case study. And you can extrapolate it if you like. But the one thing we do have in Ontario, I think, is a fairly clear policy when it comes to green. And I do want to highlight some of the actions that we've been able to take with that clear policy. I'm not making a value judgment on the policy. Some of you are going to say that was brilliant. Some of you are going to say that was just the craziest thing I ever heard. But the fact is, it's clear and actions can take place. And David this morning mentioned what we know and what we do. You can't do anything if you don't know anything. So getting that common approach, that clarity, I think is the first step. And then everything else can fall into place. So at this point, I'll probably move into um, the reason I was allowed to come was I promised our legal people, so you guys will all appreciate this, that being an agency of the Crown and, yeah, being an engineer, I would try to stick to the prepared text as much as possible. And Ontario, you, you heard earlier, the Feds are having an election and energy isn't really on the table. Provincially, uh, energy will be an election issue. And I would argue the issue will be centered around price. Um, and again, before I, I, I go on in much detail, I do want to highlight a couple of stereotypes. And usually they're very dangerous things to talk about stereotypes, but sometimes they are quite informative. So all my travels have been in uh, uh, circles with uh, North American Electric Reliability Council. Reliability is what we're all about. And when we get there and we talk Canadians and Americans, a lot of times what we find is the inferiority complex that Al talked about. We'll fly into a beautiful U.S. city, we'll sit in a room like this, and we'll be talking about issues. And then you'll realize it's a bunch of Canadians sitting in a room in the U.S., and there isn't a single American in the room. 
and we're talking about working together. So the other reason I was happy to come was here we're actually going to have uh, uh, a meaningful dialogue. Huh? Yeah, there's a few. I think the Canadians might be outnumbered. Canadians? Oh, look at that. We're outnumbered, which is great. Um, the other stereotype, sorry, that was the inferiority comps. I never even got the stereotype. At this rate, I'll never make it to the prepared text, which is really my goal here. Um, <laughs> what, not to, yeah. I mean, it was done for me, and I was told I'm on a, a very short leash because I'm going to get myself in trouble like two of our previous CEOs. I, you were commenting <laughs> on one of them. Yes, Clitheroe. Yeah. Reverend Clitheroe. They're no longer with us. Um, uh, huh? Yeah, well, I, we won't go there. Um, so when you mention green in some of these reliability conferences um, and you talk about Canada, folks think environment. Canada is green, hydroelectric, clean, and I'm talking in electricity context here. When you mention green and within a U.S. context and you ask the Canadians, they think the dollar, maybe environment, but more importantly than anything, and again, from a grid transmission perspective, they think military green. And post the blackout 2007, the move towards cybersecurity has been tremendous. So it's back to my little uh, joke here where I flicked off the lights. The second those lights go out, all this policy talk about clean environment goes out the door. So keep in mind that security is front and center in all of this. I think the industry, energy industry as a whole, not electricity, but as a whole, have done such a tremendous job at keeping the lights on or delivering supply that people have taken it for granted. And that's a good thing, and that's the luxury that allows us to have some of the debates we're having today. So with that, I'll start moving into some of the more prepared comments. A little bit about uh, Hydro One. Um, we are the wires company. Um, we move the power around. We'll take anybody's electron, okay? So if it's a nuclear one, if it's a green one, if it's a wind one, if it's a coal one, it's on our system. We move them around. We're indiscriminate. We take them all. Um, our territory is quite big and that provides us some very unique challenges. So we're roughly the size of two Texases, our actual geography. And when you think about that and you think about all of our customers, so we have 1.1 million direct customers, largely rural and urban, uh, sorry, rural. We have large cities like Toronto, which have their own infrastructure. We have car plants, oil plants, all kinds of refinery um, industry at one end, and we also have mom and pop farms and rooftop solars. We've got huge wind farms. Uh, Enbridge have, I think, the largest solar farm in North America. Um, we cover the gambit there. So the territory and the challenges are quite unique. The other thing that's very important is that geography gives us a couple of opportunities. We're interconnected with Manitoba, Quebec, Michigan, New York, and Minnesota. And those interconnections are tremendous. And now I'm just going to focus on Ontario import and export. And we often talk in terms of the net number. So last year, net was uh, something in the order of four terawatt hours. So what the hell does that mean, four terawatt hours? Take the city of Cleveland, take the greater Cleveland area. We can power that city for a year. So it's a big number. But what's more important is the ability to flow power in both directions. So that's a net number. But at the same time, in 2008, I'll pick this example, we exported 14,000, almost 15,000 terawatt hours. Sorry, 15,000. Four. Fifteen. Three times. Four times as much. The opportunity for trade is tremendous. If we can get to that common platform and we can use Ontario's infrastructure, Ontario's wires, there's an opportunity there. Um, I talked about some clarity around a policy. And within Ontario, a lot of that came about um, after 2003. So there was the blackout, the lights went out, 
everybody focused on reliability. And in the, our industry, it was all about trees, training, and ultimately technology. So those are the things that let us down. And a lot of effort was spent on fixing those things. And I've already talked about cybersecurity as an emerging issue. But the other thing that happened was an awareness. All of a sudden, in Ontario, and I think in the Northeast, people paid attention to the supply mix. All right? We're going to run out of power. Growth is going like this, and our infrastructure is getting old. We've got to do something about it. And the something about it was we've got to push conservation as aggressively as we can. We've got to have plans to convert old fleet into new fleet. And what do we want that to look like? And the debate started. And what came out of it was the decision to shut down coal in Ontario. So just let's put this in perspective. And I'm a transmission planner. And like I said, I'll take anybody's electrons. I really don't care the color but I care that the lights stay on. So today, the mix in Ontario is roughly 55% nuclear in terms of energy on the, on the system, 20% hydroelectric, 13% gas, 2% wind, and 1% renewable. That's today. And I've left out coal specifically. They make up the last 9%. It's a significant number. But when the journey started, coal was closer to 21%. So someone, had the wherewithal, the vision, to say, we're going to shut it down. And believe me, engineers like me, we're pulling our hair out. We're going nuts. You can't just pull a fifth of the fleet out of service and expect to keep the lights on. You need to do something about it. You've got to have something to replace it. Conservation, smart meters, a lot of push on a smart meter implementation came about. Um, a renewed look at the supply mix. We didn't have a long-term energy planning function within the province. So uh, the Ontario Power Authority was formed, and their job was to come up with a 20-year integrated power system plan, integrated generation and transmission and conservation and renewables. So they developed the mix, and part of that mix was no more coal. And they've been working on it, and um, you've heard comments about the feed-in tariff already, uh, renewables, wind. So we're gone from 20, 21 percent to 9 percent coal and in another two or three years we'll be down to zero. And we have to keep the lights on and we have to ensure that the technology is there to allow for new incorporation of renewable resources. So it's not as easy as it seems. It's not as simple as I took out a coal plant and now I'm going to put in something in its place. It didn't work like that. Uh, coal was shut down. A lot of gas plants came in. And when you look at the amount of gas, it was 5,500 uh, megawatts of coal was removed. In the order of 2,500 megawatts of gas plants were added. Uh, lots of large wind farms and solar farms at one end and on our distribution system um, the much more distributed resources the rooftop solars but all of those things presented technology challenges but those didn't stand in the way they were challenges they were understood it would have been really nice to have had all the answers first but the reality is it doesn't work that way so what happens when the wind doesn't blow what happens when the sun doesn't shine. I mean, those are all questions everybody has, everybody looks at. The bigger issues for us were you pulled out a centralized plant, 4,000 megawatts at Natacoke, Natacoke, and the whole flow of the system changed. Constraints appeared where there weren't any before. Power quality and voltage problems appeared. And as the transmitter, Hydro One, we put together the plans working with the OPA to make sure that we would remain reliable. So there's been a tremendous amount of investment uh, to allow things like that to happen, not the least of which is um, a 120-mile, $700 million transmission line from the Bruce nuclear um, area into just, we'll say, to the west of Toronto. When you pull out a generation the size of Natacoke, everything changes. So that was something that needed to be built. 
But what that also allows is for major wind farms to be built next to that nuclear plant as well. And those things are coming. The transmission issues, the big wires, um, are a little bit easier to deal with. And when I say easier, it's because there are fewer lines and the problems are easier to understand and they're easier to get your hands around. Um, putting the same renewable technology out on a farm in rural Ontario presents a whole host of different challenges. So you've gone from centralized big plants, even a big wind farm, to now hundreds of solar panels out on feeders somewhere in the country. And people think, and engineers thought, that shouldn't be a problem. Put a solar panel out on this skinny feeder, what's the big deal? It's like putting a solar panel on my house, I'll just use the power myself. Well, the reality was the economics started to dictate that those solar panels that farmers were putting on the end of their, um, uh, uh, their back 40 were actually generating a lot more power than they can consume. And when everybody along that same concession road decided to do the exact same thing, the road was designed for one-way power flow down. And I'll liken our territory in Hydro One, being very rural, as a one-way dirt road to the farm, and you expect a tractor to go by it every once in a while. And now you've got 18 wheelers trying to go the other direction. And there's no traffic light, and there's no shoulder to cross on, and you still got the tractor coming down. How are you going to make this work? Well, we start playing with things like smart grid, and you'll hear IBM, I shouldn't say disparaging comments about people who sell technology, but promoting smart grid. We need smarter grids to keep the lights on. And you know what? They're absolutely right. But there's um, a, a bit of a, a disconnect. Our transmission system is smart. The big wires, the computer systems behind them, they work in a smart manner and it was designed to work that way. The distribution system, however, isn't smart. It's actually, as I said, a dirt road. And what we're trying to do and what we have been doing is building the technology, the communication channels that allow us to talk to the customer and a smart meter. So I have a meter at my house, I can get pricing signals, I can do time of use rates, I can start managing my load, I can manage my demand. That's in place. And in Ontario, there's roughly 4 million smart meters. In our territory, it's about 1.1 million smart meters. But again, think of the geography we were talking about, the size of Texas. Two times the size of Texas, but big. And there is not a lot of broadband coverage or cell phone coverage. So how am I going to talk to that meter? That's a challenge we had to overcome. But now that I have that communication channel, I can leverage it for the next piece of the puzzle, which is when I build my solar panel, can I talk to the grid and figure out an optimal way of sending my power back into the system without having to expand that road? Because the cost of expanding the roads is enormous. It's just, it, it will never happen. But again, all of these things came out of a policy direction, a policy decision to go green, shut down coal, and we started down that path and we knocked those things off and there are bumps in the road and some things took a little bit longer than we'd like, but good things will come once those things get sorted out. And I could go on and on, but I, I really do want to leave it there because I think that is the, the crux of my, my comments here. Um, and if you look at Ontario as a bit of a case study, you know, a lot of really good things have happened. And earlier I heard someone talk about uh, um, some of the trade issues associated with FIT and domestic content. Okay, that's an issue. It's got to be resolved. Um, there's issues around the technical aspects of building all this stuff out. There's questions around battery storage. Um, electric vehicles, all of these things are coming, but each one of them will, be, will, will get resolved. And ultimately, 
yeah, there is a price, and the trade-off is going to be the dollar, the green dollar, the green environment, and again, I'll, I'll use the military as an example for security, but it's, it's much broader than just, uh, just that. It is reliability. All those things have to come together, and they will, but the first step is to clarify what it is we're trying to achieve on a, I dare say, and again, this is the personal part of it, on a continental basis. So with that, I'll take uh, any questions anybody wants to uh, throw out. Before we take questions, I'm going to abuse my privilege of just being an introducer to just say something uh, for Carmen's uh, in, in um, recognition of the difficult position Carmen's in. Because one of the uh, political issues in Ontario deciding to go greener than even California, the greenest uh, jurisdiction in North America, is how much it's going to cost. The feed-in tariffs in Ontario are extremely attractive and of course they're guaranteed by the government so they're fully bankable it's a triple a credit it's like uh, ontario government bond uh, and having passed out these uh, grants uh, uh, willy-nilly uh, in, in, in my little role here on this review committee um, you can see how sensitive the cost issue is so carmen can't talk about that much because in october we're going to have an election and if the ambassador couldn't come here and talk during a federal election, he's not allowed to talk about things like costs that are going to come up in October in a provincial election. But what I do think, and disagree with me if this is wrong, um, from the criticism uh, on the uh, Green Energy Act uh, and, and ramifications that has been circulating uh, all around in the press and elsewhere in Ontario, what they seem to be saying is, we can cost how much all these uh, solar panels on the farmers' roofs and the, and the windmills, uh, some bio and little run-of-the-river hydro things, we can cost how much uh, we're going, they're going to add to the price of electricity to the consumer because there's a feed-in tariff. But we don't know how much it's going to cost to do all those really difficult things that poor old Wires has been told to do, like hook up all those little windmills and solar panels and, and when the, especially when the power's going the other way is 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 that was that a fair criticism that it's not costed yet um i think a lot of it is being costed um we put forward our plans in front of the regulator the ontario energy board who ultimately will make make a call uh, some of the things we've been very careful to separate out when we're pricing our part of the energy equation is the cost to keep the lights on, existing plant. And again, uh, in all of this discussion, often you forget that the infrastructure we're talking about was built over 100 years, last time. A lot of it is 40, 50, 60 years old and needs to be replaced. So our capital programs have doubled hmm. to deal with not just that, but that and the need for um, I'll say enabling transmission and distribution to allow the Green Energy Act to be implemented. So we have priced those things out. Um, and I am comfortable commenting a bit on price because it's something that uh, the Minister of Energy has said. Over 20 years, uh, a 20 year period, the, the projection is that rates, electricity rates to end use consumers are going to go up 3.5% a year over 20 years on average. It'll probably be a little bit more front-end loaded, I think is the way he positioned it, but that's sort of the number. And when you sit back and you look at it, you're talking about renewing a sector, an energy sector, and enabling a greener environment, and that was the, uh, the, the price tag. And I think ultimately, and again, I'm not going to get into too much debate, uh, the minister's on the record uh, uh, as saying that. That is part of, uh, I believe, the, the Liberal Party's um, uh, election platform and we're waiting to see uh, uh, where that discussion and debate uh, goes from here but I do think it's it's fair to to observe again in in some of my uh, reliability uh, travels environment in in the US had played front and center a couple of years ago and that's obviously starting to shift it, it, it really has turned more to uh, uh, the economics, and we're sensing that in, in a lot of our discussions. 
Okay, we should take <clears throat> some questions. I'm sure there are several. David? Well, I'm glad you made it because I was the person who suggested you be invited. <laughs> um, I have two or three questions. One is um, uh, on the security issue. Um, and you mentioned cyber attacks, but uh, the vulnerability of a city to somebody blowing up a couple of transformer stations I thought would be pretty serious as well. And to what extent is there cro cross-border cooperation on providing physical security to the system? Um, That's the second is, I've read that we talk a lot about smart metering, but it's not really going to work well until we have fiber into the home. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but until we get high-speed broadband right into people's houses, we're not really going to capture the potential benefits of, uh, of uh, smart metering. And I just wonder if you could comment on that. And finally, could you, are you in a position to explain to us why, on the case of Ontario nuclear power, every time we do a refurbishing, the costs of refurbishing seem to be two or three times what were originally estimated. And how people are going to be out by, I can understand people being out by $10 million, being out by $1.5 billion, how does that happen? And it does so much discredit the case for nuclear power when we see over and over again these huge cost overruns on refurbishing. I'll start, from the, I'll start from that one, actually. No, I can't answer you. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say when Hydro One takes on a project to build transmission, we're generally on time, on budget. So Bruce by Milton as a project is a, a $700 million transmission line, um, 120 kilometers, issues of expropriations, issues of dealing and uh, negotiating with First Nations. Um, all of those have been built into our, our plans and we're quite <coughs> proud of our track record in getting those things, uh, those types of things done. But we, we don't play in the generation and that would be a, a question for Ontario Power Generation actually. Um, smart meter, if you can't talk to the meter, it's a dumb meter. End of story. Um, so we have 1.1 million customers. Um, when we started on the journey, we had no way of talking to them. So our transmission system, we, have, we are the largest, I believe, the largest privately held uh, telecom backbone in Canada. Uh, we deal with Bell and Rogers um, as well, but we have our own fiber network to ensure the reliability of our transmission. So we leveraged that. Um, we worked with Industry Canada to get bandwidth for uh, a new type of radio um, called WiMAX. So you have your LAN-based uh, technology in your house. Well, imagine a LAN that can go out about 25 kilometers. We're, we're building that out um, in areas where it's not commercial to talk to the end use. So you're absolutely right. You have to be able to get to that meter and talk to it or else you have nothing. Um, North American Electric Reliability Council is spending an inordinate amount of time with Homeland Security, uh, the FERC, on both physical and cyber protection systems and assets. Um, you, you specifically identified a, uh, a scenario where um, someone could take out a substation, as an example. Um, from, I would say, just traditional planning criteria within an urban setting, that shouldn't be a big deal. A coordinated attack that took out multiple targets, that's a discussion where we're sitting down with our, our counterparts in the US and some of the military folks. We get into a, a discussion that that's military's job and intelligence community's job from our perspective. And again, when I'm saying our, I mean the electrical industry. But we have to be ready for a transformer to fail on its own or for the second one to trip, or for a tornado to come through and take out a couple of lines. That level of detail and planning is built into a lot of our scenarios. We also run extreme contingency, and I would say coming out of uh, the Japan experience, um, I'm fairly confident that every single nuclear plant in North America is going to be reviewing its interaction with the grid, and also reviewing um, their internal power systems for, again, opportunities to learn and improve. Just 
uh, Jim McElroy. Jim Peterson waved his hand, so I'm going to let him go first. Go no. Okay. During the election campaign, um, promises have been made by both uh, the Prime Minister and the, uh, the leader of the Liberals regarding uh, the construction of some wires from uh, Newfoundland into the uh, Maritime Provinces. What, and Hydro-Quebec has been very quick in, and Premier of Quebec has been very quick in stating this is, this is not fair, it's going to adversely affect Quebec. Will this have any impact on Ontario? And second, what will that do for exports of electricity to the United States? I, I would think if, I'm speculating a little bit here, but if Newfoundland were to build a line into the Maritimes and ultimately into the U.S., there is a, a, a path for electricity to flow. Um, I, I think the other thing Newfoundland is doing is trying to access the Quebec market and then ultimately Ontario as well. So where that all plays out, I think it really comes down to um, some of the regulatory uncertainty. And, and, and again, I think the, the discussion and the, the premise that if there was a common approach and a regional look at this, you would probably come up with one answer. And on the other side, economics are at play. There are different, uh, different entities there, and obviously they have their own, uh, their own mandate. From Ontario perspective, if there is, well, I'll say, say it again, we'll take anybody's electron, right? Yeah, but Ontario hasn't complained like Quebec. Is that a fair comment? Um, so I, haven't, I haven't heard anything, and, but I wouldn't be privy to it anyway, so. <laughs> From that perspective, I haven't read it. Alma Lussenberg, Ontario Capital Growth Corporation. Um, this may not be a fair question to put to you, so I, I give you the option of standing it to someone else in the audience. Is both uh, your the prior speaker, Al, and you have both focused on the interdependence of the uh, energy sector between Canada and the United States. And you've gone, I won't say one step further, but one of your comments was ultimately security trumps all. Forget about green. Uh, ultimately, we're looking at essential resources, I'll extrapolate from your comments. And then I heard you say that um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, is working with the energy distributors or the, the grid people, or the reliability people, for right. lack of a better word, uh, to ensure that we have uh, the right infrastructure in place in the event of uh, terrorist threats, et cetera. So what's been going around in the back of my mind, and, I, and that's why I say this may not be the right person to ask the question of, is what about the movement we're seeing in terms of state-owned enterprises coming in and buying uh, significant assets in the Canadian and the U.S. economy, uh, or sovereign wealth funds? Um, we've been through an era in Canada where we had foreign investment restrictions, uh, but it's not just foreign investment restrictions. Now I'm thinking about things like um, COCOM security, uh, OFAC rules in the United States, which would be another layer of restriction on foreign investment in these kinds of assets if you characterize it that way. So I don't know what the dialogue has been in your industry, and I've sort of touched on a whole bunch of things, but increasingly I, I find myself thinking, well, where are we when we say this is so important and so fundamental to our economy? And I think it was Al that said that our, um, our economic well-being was really dependent upon the energy sector. So I, I leave that for you or someone else to address. I'll leave the bulk of it to someone else to, addre uh, yeah, to address, but... Um, <laughs> You got your answer lining up? I'll, give you, I'll buy you a little bit of time here uh, while you figure it out. <laughs> that bill there. Um, on the electricity reliability, electricity is a critical resource. And, you know, I flick the light switch, you get everybody's attention. End of story. And at that point, if we were into rolling blackouts on a continuous basis for any reason, it's, I think, an issue of national security for everyone, international security in this case. And our grids are interconnected, and they are a big machine that works well together. Uh, so from that perspective, um, we are working, sorry, North American Electric Reliability Council, Homeland Security, FERC, are working on the standards that need to be in place to protect the system. So that's an activity that's been going on since... Uh, 2003 and is ongoing and is in, is growing and utilities are making a lot of investments to
comply with those new standards. In terms of uh, uh, the foreign policy discussion, I, I'm really in no position to answer any of that. So, well, I, as, as, since Selma suggested I would try and answer something, even though I don't know anything about it, I will. Uh, <laughs> I know a little bit. Uh, if, if uh, the government changes after October in Ontario and the Conservative government decides to try and revive privatization uh, and uh, China wants to buy Hydro One or Ontario Power Generation, then the whole thing kicks back up to Ottawa, which controls <laughs> foreign investment. So we go around in a great big circle. And Ottawa has, is, is to use the same metaphor, half pregnant on what the uh, Investment Canada Act means in connection with state-owned enterprises and even private enterprises versus strategic industries. So uh, you're, you went pretty well 180 degrees around the circle and you still didn't have the answer. I think we have time for just maybe one more question. Thank you. Thurman, uh, it's Michael. Michael. We would be looking at significant price increases for electricity in Ontario simply because of that issue. The addition of the Green Energy Act and those sources of fuels, while they will add an element to those increases, are just a little bit of it. Most of that increase are for reasons that have nothing to do with the red herring that has become this election issue that we're paying outrageous rates for solar panels and for wind farms. So, that's a detail that gets lost in the discussion. It's, you know, it's very easy to categorize the whole thing as, as, as a reason for the increase. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that as that gets flushed out, that, uh, that uh, the specificity of that uh, gets broken down a little bit. Now, my unrelated question. Um, there'll be a lot of the need for infrastructure upgrades uh, in the province. And traditionally in Ontario, a lot of that has been a um, provincial crown to do. Uh, I think going forward there will be a significant role for the private sector, particularly on, on transmission line builds, uh, to play a part in that process. I'm wondering if you could comment on Hydro One's expectation, what part of the, um, the investment that's going to have to be required will be uh, sourced by the private sector. Okay. So there's a couple of uh, points. When a generator wants to connect to a transmission system, um, they're actually responsible for the cost of the connection. So they can build it themselves, they can ask us to build it uh, on their behalf. If there's a need to upgrade the interprovincial highway as opposed to just that little connection, so the, the big um, power system, as the incumbent transmitter, the monopoly transmitter, working on an existing asset to increase an interface, that lends itself to us doing there are going to be competitive transmission projects being put out by the Ontario Energy Board. And I would say these are projects when you look at the ability to transfer large blocks of power between one zone and another, and you can define a new asset as opposed to how it integrates into the existing, those are gonna go through a competitive process. Uh, that's actually on the verge of starting. Um, and I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks interested in, in, uh, in coming to Ontario and seeing if they can uh, uh, participate in that part of the, uh, the competitive landscape. Generation is already a competitive uh, model in, in many respects. I think we uh, should thank Carmen for bringing a totally different perspective, not just uh, strategy and policy, but he actually knows how to do it. <laughs> thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you.